Hello, everyone, and thanks so much for coming to uh, the seminar. Um, welcome to the 10th the sem seminar um, of the Contemporary Women's Writing and Medical Humanities. So it's our 10th seminar anniversary today. Um, and this online seminar is organized with the support of the Center for Contemporary Women's Writing and the Institute of Modern Languages Research, uh, London. So this online seminar series for postgraduates and early career researchers seeks to explore how contemporary women's writing in particular, be this fiction, poetry, autobiographical or philosophical writing, is currently engaging with issues such as illness, disease, healthcare, medical practice and clinical institutions. We've so far covered a wide range of themes from hospital architecture to end of life care to pregnancy and childbirth uh, to sexual health, pain and pleasure. We started in September 2020, and we are continuing until March 2021 with fortnightly seminars always on Tuesday evenings at 5.30 until 7 p.m. Um, uh, you can register for the seminars via uh, the IMLR, and we'll put the link in the chat, um, and you can have a look at the upcoming seminars, of which I think there are three more, and register for those in advance. Uh, we also have our summer conference coming up in July. So this conference is an extension of the seminar series. Um, and having extended the deadline, we're now accepting abstracts until the 20th of February 2021. So uh, regardless of whether you've spoken in the seminar series or, you've, uh, or you're just interested in the seminar series, please um, send us in an abstract and we'd be delighted to have that. So a few Zoom house rules before we begin. Uh, this session is being recorded so that it can be uploaded to the IMLR website and uh, YouTube. So please feel free to turn uh, off your cameras or turn on your cameras, whichever you feel uh, most comfortable with. Uh, we'll be having two 15 minute papers today and then a Q&A session. So if you could all remain mute, uh, on mute, sorry, th uh, throughout those papers uh, until the Q&A session, that would be very much appreciated. Uh, during the Q&A, if you'd like to ask a question, please feel free to use the raise hand option on Zoom, um, and then we'll ask you to unmute. Uh, the raise hand icon is found through clicking participants, and then your own name, and then there is an option to raise hand in the options. You may also want to type the word question into the chat box so that we can come to you next. And if you're not comfortable with voicing your own question, then please write them in the chat box um, at the bottom of the Zoom bar, and then we can uh, ask your questions to the speakers for you. Please feel free to add your questions to the chat as we're listening to the papers or any, any time, basically, uh, during the session. Uh, so uh, we'll now be doing audio description for all of the seminars. Uh, so we'll kindly ask speakers to auto describe themselves and any visuals that they're using in their presentations. Uh, for captioning, there is a button at the bottom of the screen labeled CC, um, and then it's got live transcript underneath it. And so uh, you can put on live uh, auto captions at any point. Um, so I'll begin by auto describing myself. My name is Benjamin Dalton. I'm 29 year old uh, white man. Um, I've got uh, brown hair, a big brown beard, and I'm wearing a um, like dark red shirt today. And um, today's seminar is on well-being in medical care, and we'll be having two speakers today. So I'll pass over to Becky now, who will introduce uh, the speakers. Thanks very much, Becky. Hi everyone, before I kind of introduce the first speaker I'll just auto describe quickly as well. So I'm a white 29 year old British woman with blonde hair and a plaque, gold glasses, striped top and a black pinafore dress, <laughs> like a child. Anyway, um, moving on. <laughs> so our <laughs> first speaker is um, Jane Hartshorn. Um, so what I'll do is I'll introduce each, um, I'll do the, yeah, introduce each speaker separately. Um, and like Ben said, wait until the end until we do the Q&A. Um, so uh, Jane Hartshorn is a poet and practice um, as research PhD candidate at the University of Kent. Her research explores the relationship between chronic illness and sexuality, focusing on the patient voice and drawing upon her own lived experience of illness. Her first pamphlet entitled Tract was published in 2017 by Litmus Publishing and her second pamphlet In the Sick Hour in 2020 by Takeaway Press. She is poetry editor at Ake Magazine, and I'll link Ake Magazine um, website, Insta, that kind of stuff in the chat in a sec. Okay, so over to you, Jane. Well, hi, everybody. I'm Jane, and 
I am a white woman with long blonde hair, uh, a fringe, and I'm wearing a kind of purple top. Um, okay, cool. So I'll just share my screen. Um, cool. Can you see that? Yeah? Thumbs up. Cool. Thanks. Um, I'll just get rid of this little bit here. Um, so all my slides uh, are, well, generally they're black text on white background um, with a turquoise border. Um, this particular slide has um, the title of my paper, which is Women's Contemporary Illness Poetry and the Confessional, how the lyric I can reinstate patient subjectivity in a kind of teal colour. And then below that in purple are my um, contact details. And then I've included a, an image of um, Dorothea Tanning's new couché, um, which I just thought it was a nice accompaniment to what I'm going to be talking about. Uh, for me, it kind of, well, yeah, for me, it represents um, the kind of amorphousness of the sick body. Um, it's in this sort of almost figure of eight shape, um, like, I never know how to pronounce this, like an Ouroboros. Uh, which I thought was, um, I guess, could be interpreted as the cyclical nature of illness. Um, so moving on. Um, so within this paper, I will explore the connections and associations between religious confession and the patient doctor interview. I will draw upon examples of confessional poetry in order to explore the tension between medical authority and subjective experience. I will then go on to examine contemporary examples of confessional poetry as possible sites of interrogation and resistance and investigate the extent to which the concept of the self is recovered in these poems. So to begin with a brief um, definition of confessional poetry. Um, so confessional poetry is usually considered autobiographical. It is often set in the first person and may draw upon elements of the poet's own life. Associated with poets such as Anne Sexton, Sylvia Plath, John Berryman and Robert Lowell, it emerged in the United States during the late 1950s and early 1960s. The definition of the word confession is acknowledgement or disclosure of sin or sinfulness. And confessional poetry is often transgressive in subject matter. Mental illness, intrafamilial conflicts and resentments, childhood traumas, sexual transgressions, and intimate feelings about one's body are its frequent concerns. Um, and that's a quote um, from Elizabeth Gregory. Um, like the repenting of sins in the confessional box, it is an intimate act taking place between two people, a sharing of secrets and admittance of private truths that would be forbidden or considered inappropriate in the public realm. Doctor appointments can also be regarded as a kind of confession. The appointment room is like the confessional box, an enclosed space where the clinician listens to what the patient has to say. Both are ritualistic, reciprocal processes of exchange. However, where the confessor seeks redemption, the patient seeks verification, validation and treatment. The transactional nature of confession means the exchange takes place within a hierarchy of power, where the listener, the clinician and the priest is the dominant player. As Foucault writes, the confession is a ritual of discourse in which the speaking subject is also the subject of the statement. It is also a ritual that unfolds within a power relationship, for one does not confess without the presence or virtual presence of a partner who is not simply the interlocutor, but the authority who requires the confession, prescribes and appreciates it and intervenes in order to judge, punish, forgive, console and reconcile. The context of power that the confession takes place in shapes the confession itself, blurring the roles of active speaker and passive listener. Not only is the confession influenced by the transactional nature of the dynamic, but in, but in the case of the medical appointment, the clinician has an authorial hand in the confession's composition. They shape the raw matter of the patient's confession into a story with a beginning, middle and end. For example, diagnosis, prognosis and treatment or recovery. Anatole 
Broyard describes the doctor in terms of a storyteller who can turn patients' lives into good or bad stories regardless of the diagnosis. And Arthur Frank describes them as the spokesperson for the disease or illness. The patient's own lived experience of their illness with its chaotic, tragic, with its chaotic trajectory of flux and flare becomes secondary to the medical interpretation. Frank calls this a narrative surrender, writing, the ill person not only agrees to follow physical regimens that are prescribed, she also agrees tacitly, but with no less implication, to tell her story in medical terms. The, the official story or account of the illness then is not written by the patient, but by the clinician. What's more, the language of medicine, with its emphasis on scientific jargon, may further alienate the patient from their body. Both Sylvia Plath and Anne Sexton explore, explore this tension between subject and object, between medical authority and subjective experience, in a number of poems centred on the medical encounter. For example, in Sylvia Plath's po poem, Tulips, she writes, I have given my name and my day clothes up to the nurses and my history to the anaesthetist and my body to surgeons. The eye of the poem is fragmented by the medical encounter. The nurses, anaesthetists and surgeons all receive disparate parts of her. She describes herself as a stupid pupil that has to take everything in, watching the nurses who bring numbness in their bright needles. She is passive, reduced to an observational role and devoid of feeling and sensation. In Anne Sexton's poem, The Operation, her first person narrator follows the clinician's command to curl head touching knee if I am able. She surrenders to the control of the clinician. His, his authorial presence extends to her very movements. Next I, am, next, I am hung up like a saddle, speaks of her transition from subject to object. And pale as an angel, I float out over my own skin, references the dissociation often experienced during medical procedures. Both poets describe the power dynamic within the medical encounter, and their first person personas struggle to retain autonomy, autonomy within the depersonalizing effects of medicine is clearly visible. This slippage between personal agency and authority can also be found in Lucille Clifton's series of poems on cancer. In her poem, Incantation Overheard in Hospital, she writes, she will follow you, she will do whatever you say. Like Plath and Sexton, Clifton describes the loss of autonomy experienced in the medical encounter. However, where Plath and Sexton write in first person, Incantation is written in third. This betrays her acute alienation from her body the poem's persona becomes her own ghost, emphasising her out-of-body experience. Clifton frequently shifts between pronouns and perspectives within her poems on illness. As well as reflecting a loss of agency, this may also speak to how illness itself disrupts any notion of a cohesive I. For example, in Scar, she addresses the post-op scar on her breast as though it is a separate entity. We will, live, we will learn to live together. I will call you ribbon of hunger and desire, empty pocket flap, edge of before and after. And you, what will you call me? Edge of before and after suggests that her illness has instigated a split in the trajectory of her life. Illness can cause a crisis in identity. There is the self before illness and the self post diagnosis. Often these multiple selves are difficult to reconcile and exist simultaneously. The imagined future of the past self contradicts the reality of the present self. Although her use of the first person plural shows her attempt to assimilate the cancer into her sense of self, the line, what will you call me, suggests the continued presence of an other within the self. Confessional poetry has been conventionally understood as imparting truth. To confess is to own or admit as true. And there is a perceived implication that the poet confesses in the poems is she or he might a priest or a doctor. It is assumed that the poems are based on the autobiographical experiences of the poet and can be held up as evidence of their life. In this concept, the confessional, sorry, in this concept of the confessional, the identity of the poet and the speaker are unified. However, as the examples I've discussed demonstrate, the 
the I within confessional poetry is slippery, subject to fragmentation and dissolution. It does not carry any kind of authorial weight. Instead, it is a site of uncertainty and confusion. Carolyn Lazard writes that there's a demand for evidence when we write about the body, it's clinical. There's an expectation that confessional writing about one's own bodily experiences contains an innate authority. My own body has become my object of study, but I hope not to reproduce the forms of authoritative knowledge that my doctors claim. I seek the autonomy to play with my body, but not the authority to know it. Medical discourse attempts to refine the truth of the body, distill it into diagnosis and prognosis. It looks for answers in order to provide solutions. However, the lived experience of illness is mutable, mutable and fractured. It can be contradictory and, and illogical and may resist any attempt to be squeezed into a narrative shape. Joe Gill writes that confession is not a means of expressing the irrepressible truth of proper lived experience, but a ritualized technique for producing truth. Confessional writing is poetic, not mimetic. It constructs rather than reflects some pretextual truth. In its creation, confessional poetry can be a means of articulating the messiness of the lived experience of illness. Where medical rhetoric attempts to homogenize experience, poetry and illness can explore the subtle variations and contradictions of experience and may operate as an embodied account of illness. As Frank writes, people telling illness stories do not simply describe their sick bodies. Their bodies give their stories their particular shape and direction. A number of contemporary poets have written on illness, employing the tropes of the confessional mode. Like Plath, Sexton and Clifton, these poets use the confessional to construct embodied, embodied accounts of illness. For example, in her poem concerning the principles of human knowledge, Jen Campbell writes, when I try and tell my story, I take a deep breath and vomit saplings of myself that tell translations of the same story. And I try to explain that all stories can coexist and I am many separate things that disagree with one another and that is okay. Linear narratives place events in sequential order there is the expectation that the past will lead to the present, will lead to the future. There may be conflict, but the emphasis is on resolution and conclusion. Campbell challenges the tendency within medicine to construct a unifying story, and her assertion that she's many separate things that disagree with one another demonstrates the difficulty of, rec of recovering any conventional understanding of the self. Similarly, in her poem Voice, Alana Macardo wrestles with medical authority and the right to self-define. However, the self that Macardo is attempting to recover in voice is not a cohesive one. Her eye is multiple polyphonic fragmented. Here the eye is not a solid place of self-knowledge one can return to, but a shifting landscape of interwoven threads that interrogate the notion of selfhood itself. For example, she writes, Imagine your body as a cloud, whole entity made from vapour and vapour made of shards, always collapsing and rebuilding itself, sh shredding your fabric. The processes of collapsing and rebuilding the self are inherent to long-term illness. Rather than existing on a linear continuum, the self is trapped in a never-ending cycle of improvement and deterioration of rebirth and decay. The narrator refers to themselves as a collage, writing, I am not a whole person, I cry, I am just bits and pieces. Illness is a disruptive force that makes it very difficult to hold on to a concept of the self as whole, as a container. It becomes a permeable construct, a fragile membrane that is subject to external forces. Illness decenters the self. The self moves in relation to what can sometimes feel like an external other. The struggle between medical authority and selfhood is evident throughout the poem. Lines such as, here is the failure of language, who is describing me this time and what do they mean, are indicative of the, of the narrator's inability to self-define. This search for meaning is woven throughout the poem. The narrator's selfhood evades definition, slipping between meanings, demonstrating the, the futility of trying to control a body with language. 
Macardle attempts to articulate her own lived experience of illness, reinstating her agency as a subject. However, as the lines, and what do I mean when I write it down like this, spill into existence or out of it, suggest this is not always a simple process. Hélène Sixous writes that by writing herself, women will return to the body, which has been more than confiscated from her. Macardo complicates this view. Does the act of writing bring one closer to the body or does it draw a line of separation, invite distance? How can we attempt to know the body when it resists any conventional understandings of narrative or meaning making? Confessional poetry has been dismissed by critics as lacking craft or sophistication. It has been described as a stream of consciousness, as an outpouring of unedited data from the world of experience, trivial and self-indulgent. Um, it's also associated in particular with women poets and the criticisms leveled at it may be implicitly gendered. As Deirdre Hedden writes, the confession is considered a feminized space and in a social world in which the feminine continues to signify negativity, negatively, sorry, it is accordingly routinely devalued. The alignment of the confessional with femininity plays into, plays into gender stereotypes of women as emotionally ex excessive. Um, it also has bodily resonances. In Notes Made While Falling, Jen Ashworth writes that confessional writing is a way of spilling your blood on the ground. And like a public disemboweling, it certainly risks disgusting your reader. The idea of spilling is reflected in the poems themselves. For example, Macardo writes of spilling in or out of existence, Campbell of vomiting saplings of herself, and Clifton in her poem Last Words similarly writes, I am unforming out of flesh into the rubble of the ground. The idea of bodily fluids spilling beyond their borders invokes the concept of the abject, generally associated with viscous substances such as mucus, blood, saliva, diarrhea. Julia Kristeva describes the abject as that which does not respect borders, positions, rules, and disturbs identity, system, order. In threatening the boundaries of the body, the abject challenges the notion of identity as fixed and static. Abject substances are both me and not me. In their movement from internal to external, they problematize the notion of the body as a discrete entity, as a container for the self, and suggest that body and self may actually be in a reciprocal process of negotiation and change. Although all bodies are abject, subject to deterioration and decay, it has been, it has been historically associated with the female body. As Elizabeth Gross writes, the female body has been constructed not only as a lack or absence, but with more complexity, as a leaking, uncontrollable, seeping liquid, as formless flow, as viscosity, entrapping, secreting, as lacking not so much or simply the phallus, but self-containment, not a cracked or porous vessel like a leaking ship, but a formlessness that engulfs all form, a disorder that threatens all order. The sick body is similarly associated with the abject. In the healthy subject, abjection occurs at the body's margins. However, in the case of illness, the abject can be harder to ignore or disassociate oneself from. Because of its propensity to seep and ooze, it is not clear where the body begins and ends. As a result, the sick person is often falsely considered as a site of contamination or contagion. The disgust associated with the confessional further, sorry, the disgust associated with the confessional extends further than accusations of self-indulgence, self-indulgence and solipsism. I believe it is implicitly connected to societal attitudes towards female and sick bodies, where both represent disorder and thus threaten the integrity of identity. The concept of the abject is a thread running throughout all the poems I've discussed today. And I'd like to propose that it may actually function as a methodology for writing about illness. It resists the objective truths of medicine, dissolves the boundaries of the self, and reflects the uncertainty and chaos of illness. The poems challenge the authority of medical discourse. However, they do not present their readers with an alternative truth or seek to control their bodies with language. Instead, they function as embodied accounts of illness. And if they impart any kind of knowledge, 
it is to say that illness can be experienced as many things at once. In the 10 minute slot of the doctor's appointment, the patient must recount a cohesive version of their ailments. In order to be believed, the story must make sense. They attempt to turn the trajectory of their illness into a story, even though they may not experience it as a story. Plath, Sexton, Clifton, Campbell and McArdle unravel the sense making of the patient's confession and instead speak from a place where, as Christeva writes, meaning collapses. And that is me. Um, and I've just included my bibliography if people are interested. Um, cool. Thank you for that, Jane. That was brilliant. Um, and yeah, I really like the idea of the abject as a methodology. It feels very kind of powerful and resisting. Um, okay, so um, we've got our next final speaker, uh, Cécile. Um, so Cécile Lebleu is a PhD student. Um, I don't know whether you're actually American because you're studying at Tulane or whether I just francified that for no reason, <laughs> sorry. Um, okay. So uh, Cécile is a PhD student at Tulane University. She earned a master's in French from the University of Arkansas in 2017. Her dissertation explores how the contemporary feel-good novel reflects a modern capitalist ethos that subsumes happiness to desiring and consuming a fabricated social ideal exacerbated by Facebook, Instagram and other social media platforms. So over to you, Cecile. Thank you. All right. So my name is Cecile. Um, I am a 28 year old female. I am wearing a blue scarf and a dark blue cardigan. All right, so today um, my paper is entitled The Feel Good Novel and Women's Wellness, and I will be talking about the role that the feel good novel plays um, when it comes to representing the 21st century French woman and her relationship to her home wellness. So first, I thought it would be useful to try and give a definition of what the feel good novel is. Um, my research mostly focuses on French feel-good novels, but the genre is fairly similar throughout Europe. So the feel-good novel has really emerged as one of the most popular types of literature in the last decade or so. However, this genre descends from the 19th century literary tradition. Indeed, in the 19th century, more and more people were learning how to read, particularly women. One of the most common types of reading at the time was newspapers. Unfortunately, it soon appeared that women did not have a designated content. They were still perceived as frivolous, concerned with trivial matters, and therefore could not read sections that were dedicated to world news or economics. To accommodate women, French newspapers started to publish something that was called feuilleton, and these were essentially chapters of novels that were serialized and published individually. These feuilletons were a part of the sentimental literature, which was con considered as mass culture as, was, as well as feminine. The first feel-good novel was actually published in the United States in 1868 under the name of Little Women. This book was written by Louisa May Alcott, and it tells the story of four sisters living during the Civil War. Even though this book was published at the end of the 19th century, it's only in the early 2000s that this genre really received a strong interest from the French readers when the famous The Guernsey Literary and Potato Peel Pie Society, written by Mary Ann Schaffer and Annie Barrows, appeared in the French bookstores. Since then, millions of feel-good novels have been sold every year, and authors such as Virginie Grimaldi and Aurélie Valogne often make it on the list of the most successful authors. In fact, one, if one were to look at a list of the most successful French authors, the majority are those, are those of feel-good novels. The feel-good novels really fit into two categories. The first one would be the middle bar literature and the second one would be the therapeutic literature. Although this genre hasn't really been fully defined yet, there are certain characteristics that we can find in every novel, starting with what characterizes the middle bar literature. Beth Driscoll, who wrote The New Literary Middlebrow, Test Makers and Reading in the 21st Century, which was published in 2014, defines it as such. The literary middlebrow is middle class, reverential towards high culture and commercial. It is feminized, emotional, recreational, mediated, and earnest. The feel good novel falls under these categories, but also defines itself through certain traits. 
these novel portrait realistic characters, lambda individual, if you will, in their daily lives. They often talk about their jobs, their families, their struggle, their relationships with others, their personal goals and happiness. The feel good novel always ends on a positive note. These novels are meant to be enjoyed and to bring, to bring a bubble of comfort and distraction to the readers at a time when terrorism and yellow vest movements and isolation, economic difficulties, as well as emotional turmoil are extremely present. The feel-good novels, thanks to their realistic plot and characters, as well as their happy endings, lead the readers to reflect on their personal lives and experiences. However, I would like to argue that the feel-good novel's strength does not reside in the solution that it offers to issues that readers can easily identify in their own lives. In fact, its strength truly lies in the fact that these novels up open a discussion on women's condition in particular, but also on the way our society functions. Indeed, these feel-good novels highlight the role of women in our contemporary society and therefore denounces certain issues that are inherent to being a woman. The main issue is, of course, the constant injunction to be a perfect version of oneself. This ideal seems to be completely internalized by a lot of women, and yet it's an ideal that remains unrealistic. The discrepancy between the expectation to reach this ideal and one's actual ability to do, to do so can be extremely dangerous and lead to mental illnesses such as burnouts or depressions. A recent study has shown that eight out of 10 women believe that they have taken on a heavy mental load and that women are more likely to go through a burnout than a man. According to this study, working women who would have many reasons to fall apart, um, would have many reasons to fall apart. Ambition discouraged by persistent sexism, self-censorship, double employment of mother and working woman, not to mention the 80% of domestic chores that they assume alone. In February, 2014, the technology study revealed that among the 10% of French people who are close to a burnout, women are significantly more susceptible than men. Nearly 35% of women say their work has had a negative impact on their health in the past year compared to 25% of men. The second most affected category by burnouts are single parent families, 85% of which are women. Far from being reserved to the professional world, this pressure has also extended to the private sphere where there is a social pressure to become the most perfect version of oneself. Since the private sphere is mainly associated with women, it is in female characters that this pressure is the most obvious. In Raphael Giordano's work, Ta deuxième vie commence quand tu comprends que tu n'en as qu'une, the protagonist, Camille, meets a man, Claude, after being in a car accident. He pushes her to confide in him and to make a list of things that parasite her and prevent her from being happy. This list is significant because it is mostly made up of elements that have to do with the perception that one can make of her. She says, I don't want to be nice anymore. I don't want to over adapt to others to please them. I don't want to put on four more kilos. I don't want to neglect my image anymore. By admitting that these elements represent an obstacle to her personal fulfillment, the protagonist emphasizes the pressure imposed by society, according to which in order to be fulfilled, she must reflect a perfect image of herself. In addition, the other elements on Camille's list have to do with the domestic and family sphere. She says, I don't want Adrien, which is her son, um, and I to fight all the time. I don't want to let my life as a couple go down the drain anymore. I no longer want to make my important decisions according to my mother's opinion. Camille's work, which represents a light, large percentage of her time, is mentioned only once out of a list of 10 items and is briefly summarized by these words, I don't want to be frustrated by my work anymore. By unconsciously focusing on relationships with others as well as on the image of the protagonist, Giordano underlines the importance that the domestic sphere continues to occupy in the place of women's lives. The same can be observed in Caroline Boudet's feel-good novel entitled Juste un peu de temps, published in May 2018. In this novel, Sophie decides to leave her family without warning just for what was originally intended to be a few hours, 
to escape from a daily life dictated by the infamous mental load. In this novel, which alternates the character's point of view, the protagonist always defines herself in relationship to others, whether it is through her role of mother, wife, colleague, neighbor, or friend. It is by running away on a whim that Sophie tries to redefine herself as a woman, as an individual. The plot of the story revolves around Sophie's quest for identity, a quest that is specific to minorities, as Yannick Courtel explains when he writes, the minors are those to whom we, don't, we do not recognize the mastery of themselves and who therefore have no identity of their own. The identity they received is, confirmed, is conferred to them by those who are of age. Sophie's story is also significant when it comes to her professional environment. Indeed, she compares the reaction of her, of her superior when she announced her pregnancy with the one she witnessed when her male colleague announced that his wife was pregnant. She says she was showered, whereas she had taken the Niagara Falls on the top of her head. She lowered her eyes and stood up as Marie-Jeanne had just done. That was the end of the interview. It hadn't gone at all as she had hoped. It was the end of her impression that she was living in a modern country where she was considered for her qualities and not for what she did or did not have between her legs. Her boss had made her feel as if she had betrayed the company. To her male colleagues, the bravos, to her male colleagues, the bravos, to her barely concealed reproaches. Sophie's reaction demonstrates a real problem with the perception of women and motherhood in the workplace. Indeed, by lowering her eyes, Sophie shows a feeling of shame, which, no, which should no longer have a place in today's society. Moreover, her maternity leave disturbs the smooth running of the company, giving more value to a business entity than to a human being because replacing Sophie would risk slowing down the production of the company's work. Finally, this paragraph implies that a woman, despite a different biological clock than a man, must reach the peak of her career before having children. This idea is reinforced when Sophie explains you know, when she talks to her boss, she goes, you know, I'm going to come back and I'll be the same. To which her boss replies, mm, yes, that's what they say every time they do that. And then after, but anyway, Sophie, when she goes home, cries for three hours, which emphasizes the idea that women have a more difficult time meeting their personal and professional goals simon, simon, simultaneously. Um, Moreover, when Sophie told her new boss that she was pregnant for the second time, he replied, given your new family responsibilities, we thought it would be a good idea to give you priority on less time consuming cases. She then comes to realize that her new boss decided to remove her from the most interesting cases, regardless of her qualifications. This quote thus underlines the incompatibility between the desire for professional success which is closely linked to self-fulfillment and society's reaction when a woman listens to her biological clock. The woman must then unjustly follow the rhythm of the man, even though they are fundamentally different. The feel-good novel is therefore of great interest. Its quality as a popular novel setting, um, realistic everyday situations provide an accurate pictures of the daily life of the French middle class of our time. Moreover, these novels considered feminine mostly feature fictitious yet realistic women, giving a voice to a whole minority that is often silence. The fact that the readership is also predominantly female and middle class gives a sense of community and make it, makes it easier for women to speak out the about the difficulties they face on a daily basis in a society made by and for men. The differences between feel-good novels written by men and those written by women are proof that the concerns of the two genders are not the same in a society that aims for parity and advocates equality between the genders. Thus, themes such as mental load or the perception of the value of women in the workplace plus place are less likely to be found in feel-good novels that are aimed at a mixed readership. The feel-good novels remain, however, a double-edged sword. Indeed, the advice given in these novels allow one to navigate in today's society without 
questioning the dysfunctions highlighted in these stories. For instance, when Camille in Ravel Giordano's novel wants to lose four kilos, Claude does not tell her the, that the way she looks and more importantly, the way that she is perceived by others is not linked to her value. On the contrary, he encourages her to lose her extra kilos. Here, there is a clear valorization of the image of the self perceived by others. In other words, the image that one projects shapes and reinforces behaviors that could be detri detrimental to a woman's quest for self-fulfillment, since it is dependent on someone else's opinion rather than her own opinion of herself. It should also be kept in mind that these novels must necessarily have a positive ending, allowing for escape and dreaming. For example, it is unrealistic for Camille to go from a disillusioned woman to a mother, wife, entrepreneur, and accomplished woman in the space of a few months. The feel-good novel therefore provides temporary solutions to navigate a society that seems to have lost its purpose, but it fails to provide viable solutions in the long term. Its strength lies in the representation, sometimes crude, that this new genre makes of French society. And thanks to its mostly feminine characters of the French women of our time, as well as its ability to offer a moment of escape to the reader at a time when confrontation to societal distress seems to be at its peak. Thanks to this representation of society, the feel-good novel could contribute to changing mentalities through an awareness that would allow for an open discussion about the lack of per personal fulfillment women seems to suffer from. This is what Anne Soulier sums up in her book entitled Qui veut la peau des femmes, when she writes, sexism in rich country kills little, but predestines, imposes an identity, reduces the capacity for happiness, and thus prevents millions of little girls from fulfilling their lives. It is precisely because in our rich countries, we have all the conditions and equal rights to fulfill ourselves that we must do so now. However, it would be simplistic, simplistic to think that the goal of this literature um, is solely to entertain. This is what Triscoll explains when she writes, middle bar readers use their leisure time to seek out stories of personal growth and moral redemption. The ethical values of the middle brow often position reading as a part of a larger project of social improvement. Mathilde Chabot, novelist and blogger, corroborates this when she writes, a category straddling between entertainment literature and classical literature. A feel-good novel reflects on human nature and our ability to survive difficult situations. It reveals our ability to re reinvent ourselves. Thus, the feel-good novel triggers a true reflection, sometimes even provoking change. This is particularly true in self-help novels that mix fiction and coaching. Even though reading remains a solitary, solitary activity, feel-good novels are often characterized by their online presence. Whether there are social networks, literary blogs, newspaper articles, reviews, left on online bookstore websites or YouTube videos, the feel-good novel has a large online presence. In fact, the reading experience does not conclude at the end of the novel, but rather continues in a digital format. Numerous communities gather around the same things. Whether it's mourning, divorce, or just despondency, the feel-good novel addresses themes that resonates with everyone. Since it skillfully plays on the reader's emotion, it, it seems obvious that it would have an impact on the individual. This impact can, can take different forms, that of a catharsis, a reflection, or even a change, but often translates into a more common action, sharing. The feel-good novel depends part, partly on word of mouth and reader's opinion. This can be seen when we look at the issue of self-publishing on Amazon, for, in, for exa example. Indeed, some authors now famous, including Mart Agnès Martin-Lugan, have published their novel on this platform and have only been able to make themselves known and heard and be contacted by publishing houses thanks to word of mouth and the opinions pub published by their readers. Thus, the readers share, share their opinions, their feelings, but also the reflections that emerged after their readings of the novel. Although 
these novels do not generate social revolutions. They nonetheless open the discussions on taboo themes such as mental load, depression, or in more general terms, the women's condition and to forge new links in order to create new literary communities. Driscoll supports this idea when she writes, the new literary, literary middle brow promotes reading as a tool for readers to develop ideas about their membership of large communities. And that's it for me. Thank you for that, Cecile. That was great. We can already start seeing um, some threads to weave together your and Jane uh, paper, particularly kind of this uh, feminist kind of um, critique that was running throughout both of your papers. I think it was brilliant. Um, so uh, question time now. I've got lots of time for questions. So uh, what I'll do is I'll, um, and that's, so we've got question or comment, question slash comments from uh, Stephen first and then um, from Hannah. So I don't know whether Stephen, you'd like to um, say your question, kind of comment on that out loud, or um, I thought that at least it was here. It was a comment here on the confessional poetry um, on illness. It reminds me of the flowing styles and feminine structure of écriture féminine. Um, I don't know whether Jane, you'd like to speak to that, or whether you've come across that in your research. Um, yeah, thank you, Stephen, for your comment. Um, I don't really have much more to say on that it's um obviously i am familiar with a, a creature feminine through like um sixes is a laugh of the medusa uh, but i don't really feel like i have the kind of prowess <laughs> to to really talk about it i yeah i think it's it, it's really interesting i mean i i would be very hesitant to um say that there was a particular kind of feminine writing um, and I would resist that idea um, but I, yeah, I don't have much more to say on that at the moment without knowing more about it I think. Okay and um, I, there was a question from Hannah. Um, Hannah I don't know whether you want to read your question out or I can. Okay um, so this is uh, for Jane again. I was wondering if you could uh, say something more about the sculpture you showed at the beginning. I think that was the Dorothea Tanning, wasn't it? Um, yeah. And the relationship between this material expression of bodily experience and writing slash poetry. Um, yeah, so I am. Um, so Dorothea Tanning is one of the kind of women surrealists. Um, and I'm generally quite interested in work by um, women surrealists. I think. And actually, I would say that my writing does try to reflect some of the kind of um, like becoming strange estrangement from one's own body that I think is manifest in these sculptures, paintings, etc. Um, yeah, I guess I feel as a sick, someone that's sick, I identify with that particular sculpture. Um, yeah, I don't know, I guess it, it resonates with some feeling of like the anomalous body kind of yeah, bursting beyond its boundaries sort of thing. Um, and yeah, within my own poetry, I try to embody, I guess, this feeling of becoming strange. And often my um, poetry enters the realm of the speculative and science fiction and fantasy as a way of, for me, um, coming closer to an embodied account of illness and trying to communicate what it actually feels like rather than trying to describe it um, yeah and I guess like that particular image that I showed you the sculpture um, and I kind of like phenomenal phenomenological sense yeah it just it resonates with my own feelings about my own body um, yeah I think that is that okay <laughs> And um, I think Catherine has a question for Cecile. So, Catherine, I don't know whether you want to mic off and or camera off. Oh, yeah. Okay. Um, hi, thank you to both of you for your papers um, today. Um, some really interesting points you raised in both of them. Um, now, Cecile, I might be, I'm not particularly, I'm not overly familiar with, with this genre that you're talking about, certainly within the, um, the French um, 
Well, when you were talking about it, the the novel that kind of came to my mind as a possible comparison is um, Bridget Jones's Diary, and I mean I mean the books as opposed to the film, um, because oh, sorry, um, I um, I wondered about how these because you did say towards the end there that these aren't sort of calling for social reform; they're not revolutionary books, but um, I do think that I don't know something that's interesting, and if we're thinking about feel good in terms of not necessarily how you're defining it in the genre but just sort of like how we use this in sort of common parlance um Bridget Jones's diary I think is really interesting as an example because particularly if we think about how the how the film I think has lost a lot of the point of the books I'm a huge fan of the original books um and of the fact that they are satire so it's it's actually you know it's not saying that, you know, you were talking about, I think it seems possibly more sort of work-based burnout you're talking about. But if we're thinking about this idea of the pressures that women feel being part of our, you know, patriarchal society, where there's not only the pressures to reach certain career points before having children, but there's just the fact that there's the pressure to have children, the pressure to find a life partner, um, and I wondered, I mean, something I would criticise, again, I don't know the novels you've been talking about, but something I'd criticise with Bridget Jones, I think it's really strong in the way that it confronts our ideals about what the perfect woman is in terms of her weight um, and these sorts of things, because it's really about, you know, she's so obsessed with getting to this perfect weight and then there's a moment when she gets to it and then she's just like, she loses who she is because, you know, she's just she looks really ill and skinny but also she doesn't feel right um and so I wondered if but then I'd criticize them because it's still this very heteronormative trajectory towards finding the one and you know anyway so um I wondered if there's anything within these novels this is a very long question now, I'm sorry I wonder if there's anything within these novels that possibly there's a sort of is there a kind of this subtle critiquing in the ones that you've looked at or or are they more sort of straightforward sorry for the length of that um, yeah no it's it's a great question so you're absolutely right it does Bridget Jones is also is a very good idea it's a very good example for this um you're right she does lose herself when she loses all of her weight and what's interesting is that she is under this tremendous pressure right that to be successful you have to look a certain way and it's very much the case for a lot of the books that I studied. It's pretty much kind of everywhere. And it's also that, you know, because it's also influenced by social media and on social media, that's called kind of all, we, all you see. And so what's interesting is the fact that she does not feel good about it. She does. It's such a struggle. It's such a big pressure. It's so present in her mind that it almost makes her sick. And it's kind of the same for other books that I've read. You know, it's, there's such an emphasis on that, that it really shows that this pressure is, is, um, what's the word? Um, uh, it's not, it's not right. Um, it, it makes it worse for women. And it's also the case for other things such as work, right? So you have to be the perfect mother, you have to be the perfect employee, the perfect wife. Um, really, you don't have to be the perfect self except for the image that you do project. Um, and so these novels really, they, the, those feel good novels, they really talk about how women are sick and tired of this. And what the authors suggest is like they suggest like ways to kind of cope with it, to navigate this society, but it doesn't really challenge it, the way the society is constructed right now, because it is a society that is made for men and by men and women really don't have a, a place. It's just so hard to fit in. Um, and so I think because these, these books are so popular and they're read by millions of people, regardless of their um, class, social class. And I think that's what's really interesting in these books. It's because they can, 
they can start a conversation, you know, saying, oh, well, I'm really, really sick of, um, you know, doing everything at home and having that mental load. And so without these books, we may not have, you know, this type of discussion that we could find online because these discussions also continue online, which is probably the most interesting part of my research um, is the comments that you see and how people start talking about their daily lives and how they don't, um, they're, they're just not happy. I don't know if that answers your question. No, no, it's, yeah, it's interesting. I think, yeah, I was just kind of, I just, I wonder how, I don't know. I think I just, I want things that are kind of more confrontational to to be made more mainstream, but then I don't know, maybe, I don't know. I'm just, yeah, thank you so much. It's really interesting. It's also something just, then I promise I'm done, but um, it's, these books really, they, they relate to the ethics of care. So they really talk about how we see each other and how, what our relationships are with ourselves, but also with each other. And I think this is going to get bigger and bigger because we see, you know, like the need to be close to one another, to share things with one another, to be kind and, you know, respect each other, which for the longest time has been kind of lost because we wanted to be productive and we wanted to be efficient and, you know, the end justifies the means. And, and now we're kind of going back to listening to other and making sure we're there for, you know, the elderly or the youngest people, people who need us. Um, I think we've got a question from Leah, Leah City. I don't know whether you want to uh, say it out loud yourself or, oh yeah, you're coming on. Oh, yeah, hi. Uh, thank you for both of the talks. Um, I have a question about testimony and how the concept of testimony might relate to both of your papers. Um, initially, in Jane, in, in your paper, I was thinking about whether one thing that you might be describing was a move from a sort of confessional um, form of speech which is within a certain set of power structures to a subversion of that that requires that is more testimonial that is about bearing witness or asking the reader to bear witness to the kind of the fracturing of a self rather than um, the confessing of a of a secret so I don't know if that resonates with with what you're thinking about um, and yeah and that idea of testimony also seemed quite relevant to what Cecile was just saying in response to the other question um, about, you know, what what the feminist kind of function or a, maybe not explicitly feminist, but what we might find as a feminist function in this kind of writing um, from kind of my perspective, I was thinking of it from a, the concept of feminist performance, um, especially kind of early feminist performance as providing kind of testimonial work that was asked to be acknowledged by an audience. Um, that's a great question and I can sorry I feel like I'm not very good at the questions tonight but I feel like I would need to think <laughs> about that in order to properly answer it. Um, yeah I'm not sure. Um, I, yeah I think the idea of testimony is very interesting. I think that maybe also feeds into Audre Lorde's writing um, about cancer. I don't necessarily think that that's what these poets were intending to achieve, um, and maybe particularly the more contemporary ones. Um, um, yeah, I don't know. I, I guess the, there probably are poets that do, but or, or maybe just the, the, the viewpoint I was coming from, I was more interested. Um, yeah, I guess rather than a testimony, just trying to write, I guess you could say that's testimony of the body, trying to write through the body as opposed to of the body. Um, yeah, sorry, that's a really rubbish answer, but it's a really good question. I'll need to think more about that. Thank you. Yeah, so it is a very good question. I have not thought about it very much, also because I haven't really encountered real testimonies because all of those feel-good novels are fictions. Um, 
Um, yeah, I'm not, I'm not sure how to answer your question. Um, I think there, I mean, there, there is a part, you know, where you want to, in these novels, um, where you want to, it's, those characters are so interchangeable. It could be really anybody. Um, and so it, it feels like there is a will to testify and show that there is, there are issues, there are fundamental issues in our society. Um, but when it comes to actual uh, non-fictional testimony, I, I couldn't answer that question. Yeah, I might kind of jump in there and ask a question off the back, back of that because um, I know, yeah, it's an interesting one, the fiction, the fiction aspect of your uh, feel good um, feel good novels and maybe bearing witness to a kind of sickness in a broader sense like a social sicknesses because it struck me that um it seemed to be that kind of like under this veneer of sort of quite because i've read i don't know whether it's embarrassing or not it's not embarrassing it's not a guilty pleasure it's just a pleasure um the uh martin lugon books for example oh is it les gens heureux les gens heureux lisent et boivent du café which translates to like the most like millennial woman title ever it's what is it like happy people read and drink coffee <laughs> just like anyway the books are great they're just like yeah brilliant to read um so it seems it seems with with yours they were commenting again more on like social structures social sickness so this kind of like biopsycho um social model like broad model of what illness is as the person within these sort of structures um and so i was just wondering um kind of like bringing a bit of jane's paper in which is obviously a bit uh, talking using like the abject which is more kind of like i guess radical feminism you could talk or écriture féminine is there anything radical radically feminist going on in those books or is it a bit more kind of like do kind of a soft approach and then vice but uh, kind of on the flip side to jane um i was just wondering in the poetry the confessional poetry sexton plath etc do they comment on like s social sickness in a broader sense? So for example, like, like stresses such as, you know, being kind of, I don't know, ha kind of like this sort of being a mother, um, being expected to perform all the time and to be kind of perfect, the pressures of like working and writing alongside being a mother and raising children, which I know that Sexton and Plath both did. So is there, are there comments within their confessional writing, even though they're highly personal and autobiographical, is there, are they commenting as well on like these broader social, structures and how they might be impacting their mental health. So yeah, kind of like mishmashing your papers a bit together. <laughs> so um, I, I wouldn't say that there is anything radical. There is no radical feminism in these feel good novels. However, what's really new is that they do trigger a conversation. They do start a conversation about things that really haven't been spoken about yet. And women in these books, they do, you know, it's kind of, it, it's almost like a rejection. They, they sort of like come out and admit that they can't do it all. They can't do it all. And the pressures that they are subjected to lead to sickness, sickness and can be very dangerous for a lot of women. And um, so I think in, in that sense, it is something radical, but I think if it has to be paired with the conversation that follows these books on social media and online platforms. Um, sorry, I'd, I, I think yeah, Plath and Sexton do refer to those things, but um, I, I can't really think of anything off the top of my head, to be honest. Um, yeah, sorry, what was the other part? What was the other part of the question? <laughs> I've kind of lost my... Oh, no, it was, it was um, just asking about whether, because like, their poetry is obviously like highly personal and, and um, autobiographical. And I'm thinking, I'm trying to remember, I was trying to straining to remember some of the Sexton poems where she's like talking about her analyst. So it, it was kind of what you were talking about in your paper, like commenting on that doctor-patient dynamic and encounter. But I was wondering if they both commented on like, or made allusions to kind of... Um, any criticisms of the pressures that they face to you know or the you know 
the potential impact mental, impact on their mental health of combining work writing expecting to be expected to be this kind of like very american stereotypical housewife i imagine certainly with plath we knew that happened so i'm just kind of wondering whether yeah. they comment also on this the social sicknesses impacting their mental health yeah i'm i'm really not sure to be honest well i mean i know that they both write a lot about motherhood um, and those pressures, but I can't think of examples off the top of my head for you. Sorry. No, no, it's already like, yeah, I think the motherhood thing definitely is a huge, it mm. comes into play in their writing a lot. Um, we've got another question in the chat from Ali. I'll read that out for you. So this is um, for Jane. You uh, mentioned remission and the flux of illness and wellness. I wanted to ask, when you've looked at the leakiness and fluidity of women's bodies, do the authors ever look um, ever look at this as or in a temporal slip? Interested when we're trying to imagine different futures outside of the medical discourse, how these authors might approach time? Okay. Um, I need to think about this. Uh, I, I don't know. I feel like I can't answer questions tonight. I think that's a, yeah, it's a really good question, but I also feel like I would really need to have to think about this. Um, I feel like I'm drawing a blank in terms of all the other right poets I've written about. Um, can I maybe come back to it? Yeah, of course. Yeah, it's something that we don't really talk about in Q&A, how it is like, <laughs> like question time. <laughs> like it's, yeah, it's, it's tough. So um, yeah, we can, we can sit it and come back to it. Um, yeah, um, I had a, another, uh, if anybody else has any questions, go ahead. Otherwise I'll kind of keep, go forth and conquer. <laughs> um, <laughs> Uh, a question for uh, Cecile about again about these the the feel good um, the feel good novels, and I was just wondering. Um, yeah, I was just wondering whether I know you kind of um, talked about kind of the given audience for these books, like this kind of like middle class audience. Um, I was just wondering um, if we could like if you could potentially like problematize a little bit these kind of distinctly like very like white stereotype often stereotypically French how you would imagine this kind of like bubble kind of um middle class french women in a way in living in paris can we like problematize these books at all like are they representative do they claim to be representative at all or are they just like purely targeting this kind of very white kind of privileged bubble type parisian woman women so actually these books are really meant for lower class social classes um, because they're found everywhere uh, you can find them in airports train stations you know like um, uh, rest areas on the um, on highways and they were very cheap um, and they're um, there there is a very large number of them and because the style is so easy to read it's so fluid it makes it um, it makes it like a, you know, like a two hour, three hour entertaining um, episode, which is, which is nice. Um, and so, I forgot what I was gonna, where I was going with that. Um, yeah, but so these books are also read by, you know, college professors. It, it there is, you can you can read as much as you want in it. You can just see it as an entertainment, or you can see it as something that really says more than than just entertaining. And um, can you repeat your question? Part of your question, because I know I was going somewhere with that, but no, um, I was just asking because it's they're obviously like very kind of um, sort of white middle class characters in the books, and I'm just wondering about whether the authors. Um, I don't know, maybe in interviews or whether the books on how they're marketed, whether they claim to be representative, because obviously they're not. So <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, I was just wondering if there's right. anything problematic with that going on with the books there. So it's it's a very despised genre too, because it's so, you know, it's just very entertaining. And so it's, it's despised. And so a lot of authors, when they go um, and do TV shows, um, you know, when they do interviews, TV interviews and all that, they are 
very often attacked by presentators and um, it's it's actually kind of shocking to see um, because it's it's almost like they don't want to admit that there could be something interesting um, in 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 these type of uh, novels now a lot of them a lot of um, authors were attacked because these novels offer solutions for, you know, the middle class women. Um, and a lot of the time it's like, well, all you need to do, you know, to lose weight is pick up the phone and call the dietitian, which is well and fine, but only for certain people. Not everybody can do that. Um, and, and, you know, it's, it's kind of, they have other issues with children, for instance, you know, when, when they're like, well, you can, you know, hire a babysitter. And so, they those you know the the presentators would often attack um authors because of that saying well it those novels are good but just for they represent only one part of the french society now i don't necessarily agree with that because i do feel like there there all there are a lot of novels that do talk about um women who are underprivileged um i think they're just not studied enough. They're not famous enough. They're not well um, publicized enough, maybe. So I'm not sure. Does that answer your question? Yeah, 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 definitely. Yeah, it'd be interesting to look at like the marketing aspect of it. Definitely, I'm sure that's a huge, huge part of it too. Mm -hmm. um, there are a few little questions here for um, Jane again. So uh, this is from, uh, it's from Ben, yeah. Uh, talking about the sculpture at the beginning of the talk um, and what you're saying about the abstract, uh, sorry, the abject. Um, wondering if this, uh, wondering what relation this has to something like uh, Georges Bataille's Enforme or formless and this idea that formless was a moment of limited experience of radical self shattering transcendence and ultimately positive or subversive or something like that. And how does abject relate to formless? And in what ways can formlessness and abject be a positive or subversive experience in the context of illness and healthcare? Um, yeah, so start maybe with that one. Yeah, it's also a really good question. Um, I will say I'm actually like really quite ill at the moment as well. <laughs> so I feel I'm sort of struggling to keep on to uh, top of these questions, but uh, I'll do my best. Uh, and I was thinking about. Um, alleys so one of the things i'm trying to do in my phd as well is trying to bring together i guess a corpus of poetry on illness because it doesn't really exist and in the case of i guess like plath and sexton those are kind of <laughs> acting a bit like a magpie and taking one or two poems from various poets and trying to kind of put them all together um yeah, in terms of time, I can't, off the top of my head, um, I can't really think of any poets that do kind of tackle that. But I was thinking, well, I mean, I actually have written a pamphlet called In the Sick Hour, which kind of um, uses crip time, Alison Kafer's notion of crip time, to think about how we can kind of um, reshape or reimagine um, linear models of time um, and kind of bend them to fit the sick body. Um, so yeah, that I, if you're looking for reading material, Alison Kafer's Crip Time was really good. Um, there's another, I think it's an essay by Ellen Samuels called Six Ways of Looking at Crip Time. Um, and Robert McCruer also writes about Crip Time as well. And this isn't actually on, um, illness itself but I was really influenced by the poet Denise Riley um, and her poems on grief and for me they, they were the things that actually um, resonated with my feeling within time the most. Um, yeah she kind of talks about so she um, actually the book that I found the most kind of useful was a book called um, time lived without its flow I think it's called I might have fudged that title a little bit um, and yeah she just kind of like talks about the atemporality of grief and existing in moments of stasis um, and yeah that really resonates with um, 
my experience of illness. Um, sorry, yeah, anyway, but it's something to think about, isn't it? And Benjamin, yeah, um, again, I've, I've read Bataille's in form. Can't really remember it very well at all. Um, but I also remember I, uh, I was re reading at the same time some, uh, something Samuel Beckett wrote about worms. I can't remember the title of that. And it was, again, it was something that I really identified with. And uh, I wrote a poem uh, about a jellyfish, essentially. And um, yeah, I guess it's, there is, yeah, that phenomenological, phenomenological resonance where you maybe identify with objects or other subjects that, yeah, enter the territory of the non-human. Um, because they do sort of um, transcend the boundaries of the body and in doing so the self. Um, sorry, I'm just reading your question for us. Yeah, I, I think as well in terms of illness, I'm not sure if I say it's positive, but I think that you just have to accept the formlessness uh, and the ab abjectness, I guess. Um, yeah, and I don't know if this fits in at all with the question on testimony, but when I first started writing the paper, I was thinking about recovery, like recovering, and I was th thinking about Audre Lorde, and I was thinking about recovering the self reclaiming the body and actually as I got deeper into it I felt no that it's too neat or something like that that isn't it's not about it's maybe not about reclaiming the self or reclaiming the body it's sort of acknowledging that it's complete the disorder and the chaos of it um which I, yeah I guess feeds into Fra Arthur Frank's chaos narratives um uh, does the narrative of amorphous body also have an amorphous structure none of None of these poems really do have amorphous structures, apart from maybe Alana McArdle's voice, um, which is quite long and rambling and it has parts sectioned off. Um, but I would, um, what I think, what, another thing I'm really interested in actually is artist books. So again, moving away from poetry um, and actually maybe going towards sculpture. So um, a number of artists have created books which are kind of embodied experiences of illness. Um, and I think in, in the terms of these books, you can maybe communicate the idea of the abject or the amorphous structure. Um, I'm sure there are poets that do do it, but I can't think of any off the top of my head that explicitly deal with illness actually within that. Um, and there's also this tension as well between experimental poetry and more kind of conventional poetry. Um, because, uh, yeah, and then I, I think I talked about this within Alana McArdle's poem, Voice, about spilling in or out of existence. Um, and there is this kind of like uh, desire, I guess, to contain your experiences and to make sense of the... Um, amorphousness or the disorder of illness um yeah I don't I guess that's a tension I really struggle with my poems are like quite accessible because I also don't want to alienate the reader either and I guess maybe that also brings on the idea of testimony that I I want other you know these experiences are so submerged the patient doesn't like hardly ever appears in the doctor's notes there is no the subjective experience of the patient is erased essentially um, and I kind of in some ways want to resist the urge to overcomplicate that and make my poems really <laughs> kind of abject and amorphous so yeah long story short that's something I am <laughs> that tension is something I'm kind of trying to explore and struggle with but within my own poetry. <laughs> That's great. Any more questions? You've got a suggestion here from Hannah in the chat for an, a project um, bringing in the non-human. Yeah, so you've got some, got some links going. It's kind of like last seminar, we had like a running book club thread going through the chat with everyone suggesting reading. Um, 
Yeah, I, I, I just just to reply to, to Jane, thanks so much. And thanks both to both of you. I, I, I thought those papers were fantastic. Um, yeah, I, it's just made me think a lot about um, Bataille and illness and, and the way that, uh, you know, when Bataille talks of the formless and the form and, and stuff like that, it's always kind of associated with the erotic and with pleasure and this kind of like limit experience of what was basically for him like um, orgasm or the erotic or I don't know. Uh, this positive experience of breaking beyond the body. And it just seems to me that it's weird that he didn't think about other forms of like limit experience that like break the body, like like illness, exactly like, you know, like we've kind of talked about throughout this, this series. Um, and then, yeah, I, I, I was really struck by that sculpture that you, you showed at the beginning, because it's, um, as you said, it's, it's kind of like amorphous, but it's also made out of quite, um, comfortable looking uh nice materials and it looks kind of it's kind of i don't know it, it come for me it, it has quite like a kind of positive um it made me like i don't know it had quite a kind of uh a positive air about it just because it looked kind of uh comfortable and um do you know what i mean <laughs> yeah i think as well like um from what i remember of Ties in form. Um, does it not sort of have resonances with the uncanny as well? Um, Freud's The Uncanny, which could also be brought in with that sculpture. This, um, mm. I, yeah, and again, yeah, then again, like with phenomenology, like this idea of being kind of disgusted or repelled, the familiar becomes strange, like not being able to, like feeling yourself within the familiarity of your body but also being completely alienated from it. Mm -hmm. um, it. It's weird because like that, the, his like formless thing, which I feel like he's like the most known for or, or whatever, it's like this yeah. tiny little paragraph. And then, and in it, he, the things that he says are on a uh, form kind of all have forms really. Oh, like, that's why I don't get the spider. Yeah, the, the spider, <laughs> the spit, the... <laughs> I don't understand. Because, because <laughs> that, that's all that, I remember from it, thinking, but it has a form. <laughs> yeah, exactly. They they have a they have forms, and I guess yeah, I guess, that's what I'm interested in. I guess, and like this is, I guess, um, you know, like what I was, what I was thinking about in my um, like thesis on on Malibu and her idea of plasticity, and and if if plastic bodies are talking, like are they, uh, and they've radically transformed or or whatever, and they. You know, they they still have a form, but they've radically transformed. Are the narratives that they're telling like also necessarily, uh, you know, transformed, or do, or do they do they tell like linear narratives that express their transformation? Or I don't know. I still haven't kind of like found the the, the answer to that. Um, but yeah, no, I, I thought that was super super interesting. Thanks very much. Okay, are there any final questions or comments or anything anyone would like to share in the chat? Okay, well, that might be a nice point to kind of wrap up and just, yeah, say thank you to Cecile and Jane for your brilliant papers that very different topics and sort of thematics and like, you know, um, authorial intents, I guess, with the writing, but both kind of touching on maybe the role of reading and the role of writing and production, um, Jane, for your artists and how it can maybe approach some form of therapeutics or, yeah, approaching well-being in a way. Um, okay, well, thank you both again. And I'm gonna hand over to Ben to do the final, the final goodbye and the intro of the, our next seminar. Thanks very much, Becky. And thanks so much again, uh, to Jane uh, and Cecil for your, your brilliant papers today. Um, so the, the next uh, seminar is on the 23rd of February, Tuesday, the 23rd of, of February, February at the same time of 5.30 to 7. And this will be on the topic of breaking bodily taboos. And we'll have three papers by Freya Verlander, um, Ecologies of Skin, Gender and Landscape, uh, Catherine Bryan on Invisible Chain, the female experience of abortion across a century from Jean Cochet's uh, L'Ensemencé, to Annie Arnaud's L'Evénement and Roxana Donku, who will be speaking on From Babe to Baba, Aging Women in the uh, 
Dubravka, Ugresix, Baba, Yaga uh, laid an egg. Sorry, I made a real big zero of that final one. But uh, yeah, really looking forward to that. So um, I think we've already put the, the link in the chat. So please do sign up for that. And uh, yeah, see you all at uh, Seminar 11.